TCC, welcome to church. My name is Ty and this is Sylvia and we're so glad that you're here with us today. And hey, can you believe it's already August? I know, it's hard to believe that it's already time to kick things off for a new ministry and school year, but here we are. And we are coming out swinging this fall. If you have been reading your weekly email, you probably saw the long list of upcoming events. But if you haven't seen that yet, we'll give you a few of the highlights here today. First of all, our summer service schedule has come to a close. So starting next week, August 14th, we will be back to two services at main campus and one at East Campus each week. Yeah, our main campus is located at 1820 North Jim Street and the services are held at 9 a.m. in the sanctuary and 1015 in the activity center. 
Our East Campus service is at 1030 a.m. at 1878 North Mooney Boulevard, also in Tulare. If you have been considering joining us in person sometime, this new year is the perfect opportunity. Definitely. Okay, so a few of the events coming up. We've got a congregational meeting on Monday, August 15th. We're hoping to wrap up this denominational affiliation process at that evening. So if you are a committed disciple of TCC, please be at that meeting so you can be a part of the vote. That meeting will be held at 6 p.m. here at the Activity Center, and child care will be provided. The following Sunday, August 21st, we're going to hold our next hymn sing at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. These hymn sings have been pure joy in the last couple of years, and so if you or someone you know loves singing those old familiar songs, please join us that evening. We've got lots of space, so invite all your friends. And bring your sweet tooth, too, because our tradition continues of ending the night with some delicious pie and fellowship. We hope to see you there. Okay, one more thing I want to get on your calendar is our midweek kickoff and car show happening on September 7th. This is something we do every year to mark the start of our ministry year. But this year is extra special because we're also going to be celebrating our 50 year anniversary at that event. More details to come as we get closer. So for now, just mark your calendars and spread the word. Okay, there is like a lot more coming up, but for the sake of time, I wanna once again encourage you to be reading the weekly emails that we send for all of the dates and details. If you don't receive that email and would like to, just contact our office this week and we'll be sure that you are added to the list. One more thing, if this is your first time tuning in at Tulare Community Church, today. We are so glad that you're here. If you'd like to learn more about life and ministry here at TCC, I invite you to fill out the connect form on our website or contact our office this week and we'd love to speak with you. Well, that's all from us today. So we'll throw it back to the stage as we continue with our time of worship. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Take it away, team.
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all.
Hey, TCC, I invite you to now hear the word of the Lord from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. It says this, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, and he settled his accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. We say thanks be to God. Hey, Lord be with you, Tulare Community Church. My name is Ryan, one of the pastors here at TCC. Hey, today we're going to take a look at this parable that you've just heard, and we're going to ask a question. We're going to take a look, and we're going to ask a question. It's clean and simple. Or is it? Now, we're in the last week of a sermon series that we're calling Kingdom Parables. And we've been taking some time to learn about what Jesus has to teach about the kingdom of heaven through the storytelling device of parables. And these teachings have been tough. They're layered, they're nuanced, they're complex. As Pastor Shane highlighted during last week's sermon, even the PhD writers of the commentaries that we use as resources, which are just big books that are written by scholars about what different passages of the Bible mean, those are commentaries, Even those brilliant, highly educated, fluent, and biblical Greek scholars who write the spark notes on these parables about the kingdom of heaven can't agree on what they mean. In some ways, our passage today is no different. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and by extension all of us, about what the kingdom of heaven will be like at the end of time. Now, even if you are an avowed atheist, none can deny that there was a beginning to all that is, which means that there will be an end to all that is. In the Christian tradition, it's believed that ending will coincide with Jesus' return. And in this parable, Jesus is saying, this is what that ending will be like. It'll be like a man who goes on a journey. This is a wealthy man. And this wealthy man can't take all of his money with him. Because remember, this is 2,000 years ago. There are no credit cards other than land or livestock. Wealth meant cold, hard cash. Literally cold and hard because it took the form of precious metals like gold and silver. Now, our translation says bags of gold, which is an interpretation of the Greek word talanton, which is directly translated to the English talent. And a talent is actually a measure of weight equivalent to about 75 pounds. So this rich master gives one servant five talents, one servant two talents, and the final servant one talent. Now you might ask, why doesn't he keep all of it with him on his journey? Well, if we have any mental math whizzes listening, because that's about 600 pounds of metal to carry around. 
All right, just because Nick Falcone can deadlift that much weight with one hand doesn't mean the average guy would want to drag it around with him on a long journey. So he gives the money to his servants. And during this time, these servants, they would have been empowered to go make money on the principle that they had been trusted with. They would often be given a portion of the profits that they had made once their master returned. And so the first two servants do just that. The servant with five bags put the money to work, puts the money to work, and he doubles the principal amount. The servant with two bags does the same with the same result. But the third servant, he takes his one bag, he digs a hole, and he buries his master's money. Now, this was a surefire way to not lose the money, but even 2,000 years ago, banks did exist rudimentarily where the money at the very least would have gained some interest. But that third servant opts for the under the mattress method as he awaits his master's return. And after a while, the master does just that. And the first two servants are overjoyed to see him. The servant who had been given five bags says, Master, look, I invested your five bags and made five bags more. And the master says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the second servant, who had been given two bags, says, Master, look, I invested your two bags and made two bags more. And the master says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. But the third servant, the one with one bag, he gives us some interesting background information. He says, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. It says, see, here is what belongs to you. The master is furious. Essentially, he says, oh, so you knew that I harvested where I did not sow and gather where I have not scattered seed, huh? Verses 28 and 30 say, uh, so take the bag of gold from him. This is the master talking. Take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I remember as a seminary student sitting in a leadership class with the Reverend Dr. Kyle J.A. Small, uh, whom I, I love, whom I adore. I have been mentored by him for many years. This is a guy who's preached at TCC before. And I remember this parable was used as an example of a model for good stewardship. And after hearing the parable, everyone in the class goes, oh yeah, of course, makes sense. And the commentaries written by those really, really smart, educated people agree. Some of those commentaries even said that this is one of the most simple parables that Jesus ever taught. Good stewardship. It's plain as day. It'll smack you right on the nose. Use what you've been given wisely. Don't take it for granted. Be frugal. It's about as straightforward as can be. Be like the first two servants. Don't be like the third. Great. But in that seminary classroom, I raised my hand and I spoke out loud the three unspeakable words in the ivory tower of theological higher education. I don't understand. And I didn't. I mean, I've wrestled more with this parable than with any other for years. Why is the third servant the bad guy? Why is he the fool? Why is he the paradigm of what not to do? See, maybe I'm too much of a naive idealist, which is probably why I'm in this line of work, but isn't the third servant actually the only one advocating for fairness? I mean, what gives? He tells the master, I knew you were a hard man. The Greek word here for hard, skrelos, can, only mean, can also mean stern or harsh. So this is a harsh guy who essentially admits he reaps where he does not sow and harvests where he doesn't scatter seed. Right? It makes me think of a corrupt mortgage broker in 2008 who would have offered a middle-class family a subprime loan that he knew would be devastating for the family but profitable for him, who left you in charge of the firm while he was on vacation. And when he got back from his all-inclusive resort in the Bahamas, he says, hey, how come you didn't generate any new mortgages? And you say, because it's not right. 
And he says, and your point before you're fired and then sentenced to life in prison. I mean, this is how I've always read this parable. And it's kind of left me saying, come on, Jesus, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like? Keep your head down and just look the other way on the injustice of it all? This? Look, maybe you read this parable, you read this parable, and you hear its explanations from the experts about being better, doing more with what you have, and you say, yeah, great, that sounds good. Or maybe you've already played this out in your mind far enough to realize, oh no, this is another sermon about doing more or being better or trying harder or all the things I'm not doing enough of or all the things I'm doing too much of. I cannot hear it. I just can't. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm done. If you're feeling that way or if you're feeling confused by this parable or if this causes you to cross your arms because it confirms all you believe to be wrong about Christianity, that's okay. I get it. I have been there. And I picked this passage because I wanted to take a swing at squaring my own confusion with the teaching, with the trust I have in the one who taught it. And that, TCC, is at least in part what Jesus is calling our attention to in this parable. Trust. See, when the end is upon us, the kingdom of heaven emerges, we will be forced to reconcile what we put our trust in. More importantly, and the question we're forced to grapple with is, do you trust the truth? I took a week off when our son was born last month to be home and get in Claire's way as she took care of him. And during that week, there were many an afternoon when Claire would lie down for a nap, I would hold Boaz on the couch as he slept. Now, I'd love to say I spent that time in deep meditative prayer or reading the institutions of the Christian religion by John Calvin in the original French, but in reality, I introduced my son to Star Wars. In fact, we watched seven Star Wars movies together. I kept trying to tell him we should at least watch something that's well-written, but he disagreed. He's very persuasive for a three-week-old. Now, we also watched a show called Alone. I'm not usually into these shows, but this one captivated me. Ten survivalists are sent into the remote wilderness all at separate sites with the goal of surviving for as long as possible. And their industriousness and creativity are, are really amazing. They, the trust they have in their own abilities, justifiably, is incredible. And as the show goes on, it becomes clear that the mindset each and every one of them has goes something like this. If you have to trust anyone with your life other than yourself, then you're vulnerable and at risk of being hurt. I trust me and I'm doing just fine. See, the third servant in this parable trusts himself. He trusts his own judgment and he doesn't trust his master. He's suspicious of his master's actions. He recognizes that his master is ultimately in charge, but doesn't trust him, won't serve him unless he agrees with what he's been asked to do. And some of us might say, you know what? Good for him. And if we're honest, this may be how some of us view God. Recognize that he's there, recognize there's something bigger than ourselves, but we don't trust him. Not really. Maybe our goals might align sometimes, but we certainly won't trust him more than ourselves. So while some of us can't hear another sermon about what we need to do more of to be better at, others can't wait to hear a sermon just like that. Because if I trust myself more than anything, then any moral lesson I can get will help me grow and feel more secure in my strength, in my ability to persevere, in my ability to survive. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm alone, right? So I'll take whatever I can get to be successful in that solitude. And that's what the world's religions, including the modern religion of secularism, teach. If you live the right life, the right way, in the right order, you can trust yourself and trust that everything will work out. The greatest religious and moral teachers say the same thing. Do as I say. Then you can trust yourself and you will achieve righteousness or perfection or transcendence. But what does Jesus and only Jesus say? He says, I am the truth. 
Not I'll show you how to get to the truth, so trust what I say. He says, I am the truth, so trust in me. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's just me. Trust me, not yourself, me. I'm exactly what you're looking for and I've done everything that needs to be done. Just trust me. But if you're a naturally skeptical person, that just doesn't work. As the kids say, show me the receipts. In other words, prove it. Oh, but he did. See, Jesus Christ had a mission. Humanity had turned its collective back on God, and God would not rest until the chasm our ancestors had created was bridged. Jesus Christ had a mission. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, took on human flesh, bridged the chasm between us and our Creator, paying for our sins with His precious, perfect blood. And in His death on that cross, He forgave all the wrong that you have ever done. And in His resurrection, He proved that no matter what wrong you ever do again, if your trust is in Him, you will spend eternity with Him. The truth himself put his money where his proverbial mouth was in the most sacrificial act of selfless love the world has ever known and proved that he is infinitely, totally, and completely trustworthy. So this parable begs the question, do you trust him? Do you trust the truth or do you trust yourself? And the servants give us our two possible answers. The third servant says, I don't trust that all will be well unless I do something about it because I trust in me. And the first two servants say, I do trust that all will be well because he has already done it all. So I'll do whatever he says as an outpouring of joy and gratitude. See, when we put our trust in the one who can and has carried the weight of the world so that we don't have to, when we trust in the one who gave up his life so that we might live, Skepticism wanes. The grueling, exhausting self-reliance fades. We share in the freedom from sin that only God himself could achieve, allowing us to say joyously, reap wherever you want, harvest whatever you like. I trust you. See, friends, we can trust ourselves, we can do more, we can be better, we can strive for perfection, we can be skeptical that God is trustworthy, or we can trust in the one who did it all, who did it better than we could ever possibly dream of doing and did it, because he loves us unconditionally. In other words, TCC, do you trust yourself, or do you trust the truth? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. i
TZC, in this parable, Jesus gives us two options. Trust ourselves, be skeptical of the master of all that is, be skeptical that the creator of the universe cares enough about us to care for us, or trust that he is entirely trustworthy and backed up his words with action when Jesus Christ took our place on the cross. We have an option to trust in ourselves. We have an option to trust the truth himself. Which will you choose? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.